Witch Trials Weekly, Video 29, July the 29th to August the 4th, 1692. Accusations, condemnations, and prison breaks. Hello, and welcome to this edition of Witch Trials Weekly. Mary Bridges Sr., Mary Green, and Hannah Bromwich were questioned today in Salem. Mary Toothacre, wife of Roger Toothacre, was either examined for a second time or this was a delayed examination from May. Mary's husband, Roger Toothacre, had died in prison and her daughter, Martha Emerson, had just recently confessed. Many people also believed that her sister, Martha Carrier, would be queen of hell. Mary Bridges urged her to confess, so Mary Toothacre said that the devil had appeared to her two years earlier and promised to keep her safe from Native Americans. She didn't sign the devil's book, but rather made a mark on a piece of birch bark. She also spoke of her husband and daughter's use of counter magic and study of magical texts, but said that she hadn't thought that her daughter was a witch until recently. Hannah Bromwich was accused by Anne Putnam Jr. and Mary Walcott. When those two girls left the room, the rest of the afflicted were not bothered by her specter. However, when the two girls returned, they fell into fits at her look and had to be cured by the touch test. Hannah Bromwich half believed herself to be guilty, saying that she had never met the devil, but felt a sense of spiritual deadness during church services. On August 1st, Increase Mather and seven other ministers, not including his son Cotton, met to discuss whether or not the devil could impersonate innocent people. They agreed that the devil could indeed impersonate innocents, but that it was less likely in severe cases which went to court. Now, although this was agreed upon and the return of several ministers had been released earlier, the court of Oyer and Terminaire continued to ignore the minister's advice. Martha Carrier and John and Elizabeth Proctor were tried on Tuesday, August 2nd. Martha Carrier pleaded not guilty. However, the court witnessed the seizures and invisible tortures of the afflicted girls and also referenced depositions from her earlier examination. Many people testified against her, and several of the confessors said that the devil had promised her she would be queen of hell. Among those who testified against her was Daniel Abbott, who had grown ill and did not get better until she was arrested, and her cousin Alan Toothaker, who she had supposedly cursed for siding with the Abbots. When the girls cried out in court that Martha Carrier was twisting their necks, she responded, It's no matter, though their necks had been twisted quite off. At some point during the day, John Proctor wrote a new will, writing his wife Elizabeth out. Perhaps he did this because he felt that they were both doomed, or perhaps their marriage truly was unhappy. In the will, he left all 75 acres of his land to be split evenly between all of his children from all three of his marriages. Much of the surviving testimony against him was from the afflicted Mary Warren, who was once his maid. Twenty neighbors signed a petition on behalf of the Proctors. Thirty-two neighbors and kin sent another petition from Ipswich. Neither petition helped, however, and John Proctor was sentenced to hang. Most of the testimony against Elizabeth Proctor concerned her spectral torments on the afflicted girls, a few women, and men like John Indian and Stephen Bilford. Also, several ghosts had appeared to the girls, asking them to avenge their murders. Daniel Elliott and William Raymond spoke of the confusion amongst the afflicted. Sometimes they were unaware whether or not they were seeing a person's specter or the actual physical person. Arthur Abbott spoke of the goings-on in the Proctor home. However, later he was accused of being a false witness. Elizabeth Proctor was found guilty. However, she was pregnant and thus was granted a stay of execution until the birth of this child. Mary Clark and Constable William Starling denied the accusations against her when she was brought into Salem for questioning on August 4th. The justices asked Mary Warren if she was mistaken, but no. This is the very woman I saw afflict Timothy Swan, and she has afflicted me several times. In addition to stumbling on the Lord's Prayer, what led to Mary Clark being held for trial on house arrest was that the justices found the girls pricked with actual pins. There was one in Mary Walcott's arm, one between Mary Warren's chin and neck, and four in Susanna Sheldon's hand. According to Reverend Deo Dot Lawson, one of the girls had a pin run through both her upper and lower lip when she was called to speak. Can you imagine wanting to be believed so desperately that you would run a pin through your own lips or let a friend do so? 
There was a plot against Christianity outlined by several confessors and influenced by other occurrences. Cotton Mather was sure that the devil was at work in Salem. However, he continued to caution against the use of spectral evidence, fearing that the cases were spiraling out of control and that the judges were getting too overwhelmed. What Cotton Mather heard about the girl's suffering sounded like the Goodwin case in 1688. Their pain had been real and physical. Some people thought that the girls were lying, while others thought the girls themselves were witches. Cotton hadn't visited Salem, however, so all he had to go off of was what he heard, what he had witnessed with the Goodwin children in 1688, and what he was witnessing now with Mercy Short in Boston. This video was produced with special permission from the author, Marilyn K. Roach, and publisher, Cooper Square Press. The Salem Witch Trials, a day-by-day -day chronicle of a community under siege, covers the years 1692 to 1697 in detail. It also touches briefly on important and relevant events before and after this time. We are proud to carry all of Ms. Roach's books and publications in our museum store. To get a copy for your personal research and enjoyment, please visit www.salemwitchmuseum.com.